Hello, Southsiders. Welcome to Testimony Tuesday. Excited to have you guys with us here today to hear another great testimony. And it is going to be a great one because uh, this is my friend J.D. Lopez, your friend and mine, that we're going to be uh, interviewing and hearing his testimony today. J.D., how long have you been at Southside? Um, we've been at Southside since about 2011 when 2011. our second daughter was born. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So you're coming up on your on your uh, 10 year anniversary there. <laughs> yeah, I think I get a sabbatical or something, don't yeah. I? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're entitled to one. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And then uh, JD, you're a small group leader with Corey, your wife, um, of a really, really cool small group. Oh, no, I think I lost you there. Oh, oh there back. we go. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll what? just keep cutting back and forth between a big yeah. smile. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, yeah. So, Yes, we, we do hold a, a small group um, here at our house. We facilitate a small group. Um, and our small group, we have, it's, it, I guess you would consider it a multi-generational small group. Um, we have some folks that are in their 70s and then all the way down to um, a couple of the little, little kids. Um, Danny and, and Rachel Sattler are in our group, so they're the youngest. Uh, yeah. And we have a multitude of kids. Uh, so it's, it's been great. We love it. It's, it's yeah. a great small group. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then, uh, you just do, you do so much at our church. You're also a member of the guardian team on Sundays, keeping us safe and, and, uh, making sure everything goes as planned. But then you're just kind of the guy who will, who everybody knows will say yes and will, you know, serve and will help out. And I hope I'm not announcing that now for more people. To do new things. Yeah. But yeah. Um, and then, and then maybe your most important role is that your dad to Maddie and Sammy, who are two girls who I'm pretty, pretty sure are destined for greatness and are going to rule the world someday. So, yeah. So we will all know their well, name if you don't already. Yeah. That's my that's my prayer is that yeah. they'll grow up being good good women. Yeah, well that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then one thing I love about you, JD, is just um, you know you are a guy where your faith is truly the absolute center of your life, and you're not afraid to say so uh, to people who um, who agree and who don't. And so I think that you have a really cool passion for God, and uh, may your tribe increase in that sense. May there be more yeah. and more like you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, J.D., well, let me start in then and just tell us how you became a Christian. Well, um, you know, back in the, uh, I guess it would be late 80s, I think it was 88, um, is when I first, I guess you would say, I had a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, it, but it, it was kind of interesting because it was in a time in my life when I was younger. I was at a church camp outside of Sun Valley, Idaho, um, a place called Cathedral Pines. And I recall that the pastor that night had told kind of a, a story of, of, of hell, what hell would be like, you know, if we could imagine what, what hell would be like. And and I was, I was legitimately scared. Um, so I remember that night I had, had talked to my... Uh, uh, cabin uh, leader and, and I just said you know I don't want to go to hell so um, and so I was kind of scared um, and I remember that next morning after I accepted Christ that you know it, it felt like a, a weight was lifted off me um, and I'll never forget that but um, I that was that, that kind of the first I guess you would say come to Jesus moment and and it was more out of fear and then I thought I needed to follow this certain law. And then mm -hmm. I thought I would never live up to that law. And so I kind of started living like, you know, like Dave, Pastor Dave says during, during a sermon once in a while, living like hell the rest of the time. And, yeah. and then it was about 92 that I kind of came back and I, I rededicated my life. But honestly, it wasn't until, um, we moved to Spokane that I really started realizing I needed a, an actual relationship with Christ. Mm. Um, and I, I was so bound by this law that I thought I was going to never live up to. Mm. And then I realized, you know, through, um, through living in Spokane and I mean, it was before Spokane too, but you know, it was that time when I got really involved with the church, really involved in small groups that, 
I realized that God was seeking me out and really wanted a relationship with me um, and wow. not to worry about all these little laws. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of, it was kind of a progression, you know, it wasn't, you know, I didn't have this huge moment like some people's testimonies have, you know, it was, I always kind of think it was kind of, I don't want to say boring, but in a way it was, I was the church kid that was just always in church and, uh, but I was a hypocrite and lived like, you know, um, hell and, and then went on Sunday, I'd sit there and ask for forgiveness. And then by Tuesday I'd be living like hell again. So, wow. yeah. You know, it's really interesting. Like, so what, what you're saying is that you had the re first, the reason you first, you know, made a decision was this fear of hell. And then it's that very same feeling like you've got to, you got to live a certain way and you have to do this and that, that becomes a crushing force that then just makes you say, well, whatever, I'm just going to live the way I want and continue to say the right things and be at church and do those things. But I'm just going to live my life, you know, because it's too much. It's too heavy. It's kind of a crushing burden. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why, um, so this is kind of an interesting question, but um, <clears throat> it's a little bit of a curveball. Didn't send you this one. Okay. <laughs> but so it's just it strikes me as interesting that like you you were motivated by fear to come to God in the first place fear of hell um but then ultimately that fear that first decision kind of led like we just said more to um I have to follow the rules I have to do this and that how in Jesus do you find now or did you find eventually right the sort of solution to that fear in a way that wasn't, you know, if you're, if you're afraid, then do this and do that and be this kind of person. And is more so if you're afraid, if you, um, if, if you're afraid of this or that instead turn to Jesus, how does he become kind of the solution for a fear of condemnation or, or hell? Well, I guess I got to the point where I realized that he was a solution that, that he, he, he was seeking me out the, the entire time, mm -hmm. um, through all that emotional up and down, um, through my life of, you know, living the law and, and not doing this, not doing that. Um, and I know he was seeking me out the entire time because I wouldn't be here today if he, honestly, I don't think I'd be here today if he wasn't seeking me out. Mm -hmm. And I finally came to that realization that, um, I needed somebody that I could always trust and somebody that I could always turn to um, and somebody that would always be there and, and somebody that I could talk to and give everything to. And, you know, I mean, I had a lot of rage issues, anger issues, um, mm -hmm. all sorts of things through my emotional ups and downs of how to act like a Christian, how to be a Christian, you know, yeah. um, through my past life. And, and I guess he kind of, it was kind of like he just was always there. I just never knew how to surrender. Wow. Yeah. And I finally learned how to surrender um, and, and trust in him when I just realized that I can't do any of this on my own. And, and I was actually, I was sick and tired of going to church on Sundays and acting like I was a good person. And then by Tuesday, or Wednesday, I just, go do whatever I wanted because I thought I'd never live up to that perfect Christian life. And yeah. I finally, you know, he finally convicted me and just said, no, I just, I love you for who you are. And I want you to walk in, in my ways and you're going to fall down every day, mm -hmm. but you just need to pick yourself up, get over your pride and just move on and move on with me because that's the easiest thing that's going to get you through the day. So yeah. I, really I, I like, hopefully, hopefully that answered your question. No, it does. Yeah. I really like the word uh, surrender that you used. And I think that's so true. Like what you said there is so like, I think so many of us can feel that same thing that like, that's an exhausting feeling to be like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put on a happy face. I'm going to sing the songs. I'm going to clap my hands and, you know, pretend this is so, this is, you know, so important to me. And then by the end of the week, if it's not something where you're surrendering, if it's something that I'm pretending and something that I'm doing myself, 
then it's not sustainable. You just lose the energy and, it, and you just start to feel like, well, why am I doing this anyway? You know, and it's a good question. Why are you? If you don't really, if you're not really surrendering to the higher power of God in your life, then why, why try, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, so JD, how do you think your story uh, could encourage someone else? So thinking of people from our church or uh, just anyone who might be tuning in to watch this, what do you hope that someone hears in your story as an encouragement for their life? Well, I guess I, I want to speak to those um, around Southside or, or, you know, um, in our church body or anybody that's listening that, you know, for those that are, that feel like I was the, the normal, you know, the normal cookie cutter Christian kid that, you know, goes to church and, and doesn't really have this amazing um, testimony. I mean, because there are some brothers and sisters of ours at Southside that I've, I've listened to their testimonies, and it just, it brings me to tears. It blows my mind that the pain and the suffering that they went through and then came out of, um, and I think those are amazing, amazing, wonderful um, testimonies, and I, and I love hearing those, but, but there's also those of us that, you know, feel like, you know, I kind of feel like I really don't have a testimony. You know, I, I really don't. I mean, I, but then, but then I, God kind of told me, yeah, JD, you have a testimony. Um, you are mine and you go through a lot of things that, that I want you to bring to me. Um, and just because you didn't have this catastrophic life or, or, I mean, I mean, I went through all this, all the normal stuff, you know, all the, the partying and the, 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 the hanging out and all that kind of crazy country boy stuff that we did in the small towns, you know, and, and that, I mean, I've done that kind of stuff. And, but um, for those that I just, I, I want to reach out to those that are, that are younger and say, if you're in church and you're just kind of sitting there going, well, I really don't have a testimony. I'm kind of boring. You know, it's okay to be boring. That's great. I love being boring. Um, but, but you, you don't, don't just kind of go through the motions like I did, you know, you don't want to risk it. I, and I, and I look back and I think all the times that I was a hypocrite and I still am, I still do things that are hypocritical. I, I'm not perfect, but all the times that I've missed opportunities to share who Jesus truly is to others is what makes me sad about my testimony because I, I sat in that church and I acted like I was great and, and I wasn't. And I think I lost a lot of opportunities um, to share the gospel with others just because, because of my hypocrisy and, wow. you know, you know my, I, really, I really like that JD. Cause I think that it's just a reminder that our testimonies are, are meant to be less about us. So, you know, it's, might be fun to have like a, you know, I went through this and I did that and I, you know, I was a horrible person and, and then this amazing moment happened and there was a, you know, flash in the sky and, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but ultimately our testimonies aren't meant to be about us. They're meant to be about God. They're meant to be about how, how God has saved us through Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, um, we may have in really interesting stories or stories that sound like everybody else's stories, but the story that matters is the story of the gospel. And, and that's the story that comes into our lives. And even not, not that it comes into our lives, but that we enter into it. We become the people of God who are saved by Jesus Christ. And, and that's the cool story. And that's the engaging story that we get to tell people through our own yeah. stories, whether they're interesting or not. So, yeah. So that's really good. Let's yeah. go to our, um, let's go to our lightning round. So I've got a few okay. fire questions for you. So just first okay. thing. The, uh, that pops into your mind. This is a fun one I've been doing first. Um, okay. A preacher, a book, or a song that has encouraged you recently? A, a preacher, a song, or what? Or a book. Any of those. Oh, or a book. Um, oh, man, it's on my shelf, too. Oh, uh, there's, a, there's a book called Fearless. Fearless. And it's Fearless by Eric Blem. Okay. And it's about Adam Brown and he was a Navy SEAL. Um, and that one really, that was a great book. It was a good inspiration because he was a Christian and awesome. had a really heavy testimony. 
there you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A <laughs> good story. Um, okay, here's a here's a, another one. Um, so you mentioned you're a country boy. I wonder if this will play into it. Uh, your first car. Uh, 1979 Camaro LS, nice. white with white with baby blue interior. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the country boy truck. <laughs> what happened to it? The oh, I drove that thing into the yeah. ground. I yeah. I try to modify the exhaust and all that country boy stuff, you know. <laughs> nice. nice, that's awesome. Um, okay, let's do uh, one more. Um, give us your best tip for coping with quarantine? Oh, <laughs> my best tip is just to turn off the news. Yeah. That's you know, just, yeah. just, just turn it off and, and get in your Bible. Cause I've been doing that a lot more. I, I honestly, I think this is a good way of God saying, get in your Bible, JD, cause cool. I've been getting in it a lot more and shut off that TV. Yeah. So maybe, you know, to put it, let's put a little preacher twist on it. We'll say, turn off the news yeah. and get into the good news. Uh, Amen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> People are groaning as they watch this right now. <laughs> well, JD, thanks for doing this, man. I, uh, I think this is going to be an awesome uh, uh, testimony and an encouragement for a lot of people in our church. And thank you, Southside, for tuning in to Testimony Tuesday. Hope you enjoyed hearing how God has worked in JD's life. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing how God has worked in so many of your lives over the next few weeks. Uh, just uh, remember that God is with you through all of this. And, uh, and we will be back eventually as a church to worship together in the same place in the same building. And until then, we continue to worship and to encourage one another in any setting because the church is the people of the church. It is not the building. It's not the service. Um, and we can be that people of God no matter what in any circumstance. We'll see you soon. This is Colin and JD signing off. Thanks again.